And this conference will now be recorded. Okay. Did did you send the email to Tanya? Yep, and I see she just arrived there. Perfect. Oh yeah, I see her too. Good, good, good. You have to comb your hair and put lipstick on for meetings. <laughs> We're not used to that. Cosmetic sales are way down. <laughs> I bet they are. <laughs> they talk about that before. Like you wear a mask. Well, that's it, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Except Brianna's a billionaire because of her cosmetics business, so. Yeah, but it's a different oh, Ellie, of her cosmetics than you and I. <laughs> <laughs> Ellie, you can uh, call the meeting to order now when you're ready, and we can start the oh, agenda if you're good to go. Okay, everybody's here, eh? All right, so welcome, everyone. Uh, really happy to have you. It's still unusual doing these uh, video meetings, but hopefully this will pass and we'll soon meet in person. Um, so I'd... Um, like to call the meeting to order and the first order of business is confirmation of the agenda. Is there anything anyone wishes to add to the agenda today? Okay, with that, uh, I'd like to move that we accept the agenda as presented. Do we have a seconder? I'll second, Arlene. Okay, thank you, Arlene. Okay, uh, declaration of pecuniary interest. Is there anyone who has an interest in any of the topics today? No? All right, so no, no, uh, no declaration of pecuniary interest. So we'll uh, move in to the first uh, item and uh, it's uh, welcome to Tanya Shute, uh, manager of Allied Services. Is that still your title, Tanya? Hi, Ellie. Yes, it is. Okay, great. Well, great to have you. And um, so we'd like to start with your your presentation. Tell us what's happening and what's new at Southeast Gray Community Health Center, particularly in regard to uh, community um, health services. So there you go. Sure. You have the floor. Can you guys see me? No. 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 I'm, no. I'm trying to kind of depress this thing, but when I press the what looks like a camera, it says view it just says view webcams, all talking or none. So how do I take myself off? Like mm -hmm. you have your camera always your computer? Are you are I you under I... a certain view, Tanya? Pardon me? All right, which view are you under? View everyone? yeah and then you're is this, are you maybe hitting the screen button instead of the camera button no it's definitely the camera button as soon as i press it it just says uh oh it says share my webcam maybe that's up oh, there you go, oh, there yeah. you go. I, had to press, I had to press more there. than one button. there she is good good Very good 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 all right you guys so um <laughs> just kind of informally um we are just like many of the organizations right now, kind of getting back to what the normal is gonna be come fall time. Um, we specifically in Southgate, we've been operating out of Erskine for Wednesdays and Thursdays. Since I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say sometime in spring, late spring, mid spring, um, we've been operating there out of two days uh, a week, Wednesday and Thursday. And so uh, we have our social worker there, we have our dietitian there um we have our community food coordinator there our health promoter there um so we have been bringing clients in and uh when they do we kind of do a because we don't have the same resources as some of the other bigger sites with for instance in markdale um <clears throat> we don't have anybody screening for us outside um so we can't really just have people coming and going so we do usually keep the door locked but not all the time just depends on how many people are in the building and uh, then we do our screening and due diligence that way and then we will bring the client in. <clears throat> a 
what we're finding with in individual services like the dietitian, social work and physio, there's still a large majority of people. I wouldn't say majority, I'd say a large number of people who are still requesting um, to have virtual visits. So they still want either um, on the phone or they want kind of what we're doing right now, um, you know, in a, in a more confidential space, but they're still opting to have, um, you know, a virtual visit. So we're, we're kind of abiding by that. And, we're, and so sometimes we might be at Erskine, but um, the, the amount of appointments that day are, are majority virtual. Um, so we're just kind of trying to meet the need where it's at. And, um, you know, we've been increasing our time in the clinic. In fact, we haven't been closed at all during the pandemic. We've been coming in, um, you know, at, at, I think kind of the peak we um, back in 2020, we were in a pod format just to limit the amount of staff in, in the building at any one time. So we had people kind of rotating, um, but that kind of um, come summertime 2020, um, when things kind of subsided a bit, we, we went back to pretty much a normal schedule. And we do have practitioners working home about one day a week. Um, and that's kind of their day to do administration work and also do virtual visits. But what we're finding is even when we are in clinic, whether it be the nurse practitioner, whomever, um, there is still a demand for virtual visits and that's for seniors that's for people who have accessibility issues coming but also you know um i heard one one individual say um he works down let's say around orangeville or something or he doesn't know it's unpredictable and so to have a doctor's appointment booking the morning off coming in and and having his appointment versus knowing that it's going to be say at 10 15 in the morning and just being able to take the phone call pull aside to the road and, and do your appointment there so people are starting to see it as also a more of a convenience um there are clients that we still want to see have eyes on so if there's mental health concerns if it's a new baby um you know some failure to thrive or, or some frail frail um this we're, we're we're definitely encouraging people to come in we need to see see you and have eyes on um the nice thing in terms of our wait list, we've been working through our wait list. I don't believe at this time we have a wait list um, or if we do, it's very minor. Um, it's just about capacity and how many people we can onboard um, in a week during any given time. So we were able to um, catch up on that. And I know that within the pandemic, that was um, something that I saw on sometimes social media or heard in the community that there, there was, you know, um, some people weren't weren't too happy that we did have a wait list at that time, um, but we've been able to catch up and uh, should be able to take people in real time. So that's a, a positive. Um, some of the things, so during the the last uh, two, 2020, 2021, we, we did have to cease our programs, our community programs. Um, so really that would involve things like the yoga, the Tai Chi, um, the Pilates, the chair fitness classes, etc. And so we did adopt um, a virtual component for that, a Zoom component, so that we were able to offer. We, we, we reached out to our providers, the people who do those classes, and asked who, who would be willing to um, take that on virtually. So we did have agreement from the yoga that, yes, they would do um, a Zoom format twice a week. And Tai Chi was a little bit more difficult because um, rightfully so, um, when it was explained to us, when you're doing the movements and people are standing behind you, you want to be able to show them and then they kind of mimic that. And so when you're turning away, the camera's not going to pick up your voice. And so, um, but you know what, he's, he's really kind of persevered with that. And I think that we've, we're in discussion right now, come fall time, if we could even offer maybe one in person and keep one in Zoom, um, because even this past winter, although we didn't have terrible weather, we did have to close the clinic on one day and we never had to worry about reaching out to any participants because everybody was, you know, safe in their homes and they were able to still attend appointments and still attend the virtual programs. Um, and we did reach out to some of our partners. So as you're aware, at Erskine site in, in Dundalk, we are partnered with a number of people, Gray County, um, we're partnered with uh, Keystone, we're partnered with CMHA, uh, Southeast Grace Support Services, Legal Aid. And so we reached out to them come summertime when we were ready to go back to Erskine and, and asked kind of what the appetite was and, and what direction they were given from their organization to come back. And it was a flat no. Um, we were seen as a satellite uh, location and people um, within their organizations were being pulled back to kind of the main sites 
and or being redeployed to other other areas and so i've reached out since then at least two more times asking kind of when can you guys give me an idea even a ballpark are you thinking maybe come fall you're going to revisit it and there's still a, a real um no nothing at this time um so i know one one feedback i had from gray county who operates the ontario works program um barb betty who's the director there had said that during the pandemic or leading up to the pandemic one of the things that Ontario works on, like through a provincial system was working on, was something that was really automated and through the telephone. And COVID really ramped that up and got that out um, well in advance of what they were expecting. And um, virtually what she say, said to me was that um, Ontario works generally were looking at these satellite locations because they needed what they call a quote unquote wet signature to proceed with things. But now because everything's done via phone, they're not really sure how much time they're going to actually be coming back to to Dundalk or to Erskine. So that's kind of um, a piece to be discussed at some point. And we, we just keep touching back back um, with our CMHA, with um, legal aid, with Southeast Grace Support Services to see um, what their direction. So it's kind of difficult to then open up more days at Erskine when we don't have those key players that kind of help us um, staff and resource the center. Um, and, and each organization is, has such different directions in terms of what their service mandates are. We don't have any control over that. So we're just kind of sitting tight and uh, like I said, reaching out and trying to, to keep an eye on that. Um, we continue to do uh, in-home nursing visits. So we do have nursing that goes out and, and checks on our seniors. You know, they'll sometimes look at um, lab services, um, urinalysis, picking up urinalysis, um, being able to, um, you know, do a wellness check, um, a whole myriad of things that nursing might go out for. Some of our nurse practitioners still do at-home visits and they'll go out and, and do those, those visits in the home. Um, there is also our palliative care program, so that's done in the home. And although we do partner really strongly with the palliative care network and, and the resources that are in place, we are, um, you know, the primary care provider, so we are a piece of that puzzle too. So there is still a, 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 an in-home presence, but I can't, I can't reiterate enough how much, um, how, how still people are wanting that virtual component. So I don't think we'll ever completely get away from it. I think it's going to be with us forever and I think what we need to do is kind of marry the two together um, and be able to um, offer both for people um, who, who, who could have a choice with that. Um, one of the things that uh, or two of the things that we were looking at um, and have kind of persevered throughout COVID if not really kind of um, grown is the check-in and chat program. And the check-in and chat program um, actually came, was a brainchild of, of this committee right here when we were doing the Southgate um, age-friendly engagement sessions in Dundalk and down in Holstein. Um, the feedback that came strongly from this group and this community was that, you know, um, there's people down those long driveways and we don't know how they're doing. We don't know if we necessarily have the comfort to go and just knock on the door and check in. What if they don't want that? So how do we, how can we kind of have a system um, that we can kind of check on people. So we were able to um, recruit volunteers who had time during COVID and wanted to reach out and lend a hand. Um, and we we're able to do all the due diligence in terms of police checks and, and orientation, et cetera. And we've been able to pair them with um, people in the community. So majority are isolated frail seniors, but that's not always the case. Um, and, you know, it's not a really invasive program. It's not something where people are kind of grilling you on, on how are you doing, et cetera. It's very kind of superficial. It's meant to check in on people. And sometimes people have said to us during the pandemic, you know what, I have, I have, um, my kids live in, you know, another province and they haven't been permitted to, to, to come here and check on me and they're worried. So they phone and they check on us. But, you know, people are worried, like, what if I fall and what if something happens and somebody's not checking? So this was just one more layer of being able to have that that um, offered up to people. Um, and we do work closely with home and community support services that does other kind of friendly visiting programs, trying to kind of, um, you know, work with those as well. I do know at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of things shut down. Volunteers weren't weren't permitted in most organizations to do any outreach. A lot of transportation systems had shut down too. So I think we've all learned from that. And, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a wise thing not to have all our eggs in one basket, one service, and to actually 
make sure that no no door is the wrong door every door is the right door um we also had the yum program so i i'm not sure how much i've spoken about this in this group before but our yum program initially was launched with our registered dietitians who recognized a need of people who had special dietary um, needs so things like gluten sensitivities or allergies dairy um, nut allergies shellfish allergies and they were going to sometimes access the food bank and not getting necessarily the right foods that were going to meet their diet and there was a lot of conversation in the community where people were kind of like well you know this is what we've got so so kind of be happy take it not that was direction wasn't coming from any one food bank but there you know even if people are going out to sometimes buy, buy um donations if they can buy a 99 cent thing of pasta versus a three dollar thing of gluten-free they're not going to think to buy the gluten-free um pastas and so this was really just meant to augment what was already there we do still value the the what the um, food banks do for the folks and that should be kind of that first um line of action um but this is was meant as kind of that peripheral piece and um so what really happened with that is we got some some seed funding to start that program and right at the time we were launching that come march um COVID had hit and we got a substantial um interest from the community places like united way gray county asking us well what more can you do what what's your capacity and we said well we don't have anyone paid in this position we can't we're not permitted to bring volunteers in and food costs are really sky high and at this point i think one of the food banks close to us was giving out um, food land cards and so individuals who didn't necessarily have the transportation or had to spend some of that food land card for delivery costs you know this again was just a bigger conversation of us not having a playbook not knowing never been here before not knowing how to kind of move forward and talking with community partners to say we don't want to duplicate anything so what can we do to kind of fill the gap and what we found is that there were um there were seniors who couldn't afford things like the at the uh, meals on wheels programs um or um necessarily kind of the groceries etc so we did start to fill a need in terms of um frozen meals um for for our seniors and for other people who are kind of at a lower income um bracket who were kind of in need so this um this kind of played with the yum program so the yum program still trying to meet that special dietary need but we started to kind of um mass produce more meals and so we in that time we we partnered with oshare up in uh owen sound and oshare kind of um also acts as a bit of a regional food distribution center so places like no frills foodland zares you know it's uh Easter time's over and they're stuck with about 30 extra turkeys, well, they start coming to O'Share. So O'Share is going to try to process as many as they can and make meals for their, their um, soup kitchens and their meal program. But they're also aware of these kind of uh, programs in the in Chesley and, and, and us down in Markdale and, and Dundalk trying to prepare meals. And so we, we actually, part, what innovative thing that the United Way did was that they reached out to Habitat for Humanity who had to close their doors during during um, COVID and they actually uh, were able to, to contract out the use of their truck to bring food back and forth to us. So every Monday we would get a delivery, we get some amazing food that was what we call rescued food that we would be able to quickly turn over and make into meals. And at one point, I think we priced out our meals and we our meals cost anywhere from 50 cents a meal to just under $2. Um, so the costs were kept really low in terms of what we were able to buy on our own and then augment what food was coming. The most expensive cost in that was our, um, our containers. And so um, through a process of more grants, we were able to get this really neat system. It's called SEMA Pack where it's actually less waste too because we we're really worried about those big um, clunky plastic containers that were going out these are almost like a paper a really thick paper if you ever get frozen meals at the store and you pull, pull them out you rip off the plastic sometimes you see they're almost like a really thick paper so it's that material and you just kind of bring down the iron and it seals it off for you so it's very much more environmentally friendly um, and we uh, brought down our, our, our costs even more. Um, unfortunately, come March 31st of this year, 
most of those big grants that were coming out for COVID started to taper off and come down. Um, we had to get our reports out and the money kind of ceased almost altogether. Um, we had been working really hard on a sustainability plan, knowing that this was kind of what we were um, working towards. We could still access that food from OSHARE. Um, we still could um, access some money from from grants, et cetera, to, to kind of, uh, we did some creative things like we bought, we bought um, uh, I don't know how you would call it, like a, a tab sort of thing at the butchers up in Maxwell and at, over in Chatsworth, we were able to kind of prepay. So then with some of that grant money, we knew we could carry ourselves over for a longer time and still support local. Um, we also did that with the Good, um, Good Food Box. We partner with um, United Way and Bruce Power has these tokens that we can get out to people to have free um, Good Food Boxes. And so essentially, um, essentially we're just trying to make sure that it's as sustainable as possible. The key cost in all this is it comes down to human resources. It's, it's having somebody who can kind of drive it. Um, because even though we want to have volunteers coming in, we, we picture, you know, a rotary a group coming in once a month to make soup or a church group coming in once a month and, and maybe their thing is chili. Um, you know, even so there needs to be a point person who can coordinate all of it and who can accept food donations and quickly look at it on Monday and say, you know what we need for this? we can make this or we we need this to kind of go with it and then go out, procure that, bring it back and get it ready for the volunteers. And volunteers don't want to show up and, and think to themselves, does anybody even know I'm here? Did anyone know it's here? Like they need to see faces and someone needs to be more involved. So currently we do have one person who's on staff with us. Uh, her name's Madison and she is um, the community food coordinator. And she has a lot of food kind of background and experience and she lives down in um, kind of the up in Badgerose area. And so she's she knows she's familiar with the area and she's been really kind of supporting that, um, bringing some meals out to the Skyview Motel. Um, so we've been working with kind of the, the surrounding municipalities to see how we can support, even though it's a little bit out of our catchment area in terms of Gray County most of the YMCA housing which is situated here is placing our kind of residents from Gray County at Skyview Hotel so we're still trying to kind of support people while they're in that transient housing um, before they kind of move on so that's been a real undertaking for us is that um, YUM program um, it's ever evolving uh, we want to make sure that it, it meets needs and um, in about two weeks time so the the first week back in September we're, we're overjoyed that Crystal Ferguson's finally coming back from her parental leave. And um, this is really something that she spearheaded in terms of that overall food security conversation, pulling in things with the great, with um, the, the health unit, talking with our master gardeners, how do our gardens play a part of this? And so she really sees that bigger area and can kind of make sure that um, people don't ever become dependent on one thing, but we're always trying to kind of improve the situation. And playing off of that, it's things like our income tax program. I think this is one of our highest years of income tax returns that we've done. And we weren't able to do them the traditional way of having people come in. It really has been a matter of collecting and delivering, collecting and delivering. So just a different way of going about business, but still trying to meet needs so that while people are trying to um, cope and and thrive during the pandemic that their benefits aren't going to get cut off all of a sudden so that we can continue to have those things kind of going on. So like I said we also did the income tax program, um, the gardening program, we've been um, trying our best, we've been um, reaching out to people who, who have normally done the gardens. There hasn't been a lot of uptake but again we've noticed this with people a little bit hesitant to come back, right, to go from this to this. So there needs to be kind of a, a warming up period or a leaning in period. So we haven't seen a lot of interest in the gardens necessarily this year, but we've been managing best as possible. And we'll kind of take that um, lettuce and the herbs and the things that come from the gardens, donate them back to the food bank for fresh produce, and then also um, for the YUM program. Um, and I guess going forward, what our plan is, I was just in contact with the Upper Grand District School Board. Um, they're the ones that do the skills upgrading in Erskine at the lower level twice a week. And that was something that Gray County was really asking us to do. Um, people were having to be 
pulled all the way to Mount Forest. And this is something that's actually really um, become something that, that helps that whole building that socioeconomic status of our whole community. Um, so they're going to be coming back again on Mondays and Thursdays. And so we start to see this natural kind of building back of our programs. I don't think it's just going to be a snap and they're all happening again. Um, I know that Ellie, um, or Doris, sorry, um, has reached out, Doris Nurcom, about the Young at Heart seniors coming back. <clears throat> so I think what's going to happen is we're just going to see um, a slow kind of building back of, of our programs um, just to be able to do it safely and do it right. Um, so I, I anticipate come the fall time we'll be open at Erskine Mondays, Wednesdays and Thursdays with the hope to come to Tuesdays as soon as we possibly can with, with um, staffing. I'm trying to think if I can think of anything else. Um, again, a lot of the programs that we that we enlisted were um, were partnered with community agencies. So it's going to it's going to some of it's going to have to come down to whether or not they're they're coming back and and when, um, so that we can kind of balance that piece out. Um, I'm not sure if I can think of anything else at this point specific to seniors. We have some other things kind of cooking with Southgate with the library and a few other things on the horizon, but that would be more youth and sometimes um, different specialized populations as well. The one thing maybe I'll mention um, uh, when I was talking about Madison doing kind of the, the food program, her funding came from something called Food Fit. And Food Fit is able to um, provide uh, hands on kind of cooking. It's almost like a, a take on community kitchens. And so she's been able to do that virtually. We, um, if you, you know of those programs where people um, deliver those chef boxes at home and they get a mailbox and they open it up and it tells you what to do when you build a meal. So essentially it's, it's like that. She's delivering these, these, these boxes of food to people and then they're, they're linking on and they're building this meal together. So that's been really successful. She's been uh, doing that throughout uh, Southgate, throughout Grey Highlands. Um, she's gonna be doing some work with some of the group homes up in um, even some of our other areas with our partner CMHA. And I know she's um, been talking to Ethan and they're looking at doing a youth, a take on that a smaller version for youth um, this summer as well. Um, so we do have the food fit that's been kind of going um, going quite strongly as well. So best best of, of what we can, we can kind of offer. I'm not sure if I've left anything out. Um, I think this is our this is our 10-year anniversary. Um, so uh, within the next, uh, I say next few weeks, you can expect everybody can expect to receive some type of save the date invitation. We're hoping to have some type of open house. It will be at the Markdale site, and I'll tell you why. Um, we have invested a lot of time and resources into the new 24-hour gym that's going to be opened and the new classroom. So we've been just renovating the other side with the partners, so similar to what we did at Erskine. Um, and we've kind of given the contractors an end date. So we're hoping to move all the equipment over and be able to um, have people come and tour the space and see the new garden that's there. Um, so we're gonna um, have that on, on the morning of the 1st, which is a Friday, October 1st. So we'll be sending those out as soon as I, um, as soon as I can. Wow. I'm I'm so impressed, Tanya. I have been in the past, and so much of what you spoke about today, I had uh, I didn't know about. And uh, it's you have your hands in everything, and I think you're so proactive in uh, keeping aware of the needs in the community. It's uh, very very special, and I guess as things open up, that uh, the programs will will continue. D does anyone have questions for Tanya? Ellie, can you just grab a mover and seconder, just to receive this information, oh. please? Yes, okay. Um, well, I'd like to move that we accept Tanya's report as uh, as presented. Do we have a seconder? That's Ellie, I'll just get maybe a Catherine. second, someone other than you to, uh, oh, to okay. move it, just because you're the chair. Muriel, okay. And Catherine will second it. All right. Where, where do your clients come from, Tanya? Like, how, how do you reach out to the community? What do you mean, where do they come from? Uh, well, do they, they come in for appointments? And so you, you kind of uh, become aware that they might need more support services. How, how do they, like, where, you know where what? Do they... It, it, 
there's a lot of different there's a lot of different avenues um you know we we t i was just talking to our new clinical manager the other day and we were talking about something called the poverty screening tool and it's a simple question that your nurse practitioner or doctor can ask you in the room just say so um are you having trouble making ends meet and you'd be surprised at how many people say yes and then the next conversation is you know have you got your income tax done and they say well yes or no and then they can go over to crystal or jeff and uh they can they can get support with income tax and then that opens up did you know you can be qualified for hydro supports do you know you can be qualified for different food food um supports so um you know we we sometimes get people that way we we have such a close relationship with our partners that quite often they're coming to us but I'll tell you that even though I think we've done a good job trying all different communication streams like newsletters and, and radio and newspaper, still people don't necessarily know that we can be a catch-all. And, and we did have a, a situation where I had um, somebody who we worked with quite closely. He's a senior, but his mom was coming out of the hospital. And he ended up calling the Council on Aging, which Muriel is a part of, um, and talking to one of my colleagues there saying, who do we call about placement? What And he was asking questions about home care. And I thought, goodness gracious, why didn't he call us? We could have, he could have asked us all these questions. We would have helped system navigate. We would have helped um, advocate for him and, and navigate through that system and help him with the resources. But I think sometimes people don't see that bigger picture or the catch-all. They see it maybe very, um, well, that's a doctor's office. Why would I, what would I call them there for? So, one of the part, one of the projects we're working with, um, with the Active Lifestyle Center in Owen Sound, is something called Seniors Ask, where um, it's kind of a, right. it's kind of um, a bit of a take on the a block parent model, where you have something in your window that says this is a this is a place to come, and it's a little decal that kind of um, speaks to that built environment, and it's just a recognized brand that come in and ask any question you want about anything. Um, that's what we're here for. And if, if we don't know, we'll find it out for you. Um, so it's really all different avenues people come to get care for us. Um, we try to do, you know, again, I remember very distinctly doing our engagement sessions in Southgate and hearing how different people want different communication. So sometimes it is consistently news, newspaper. Other people said, no, if I don't read the newspaper and it's gone, it's a one, it's a snapshot in time and I need something I can keep going back and referencing like the, like the rec guide or the website. So different for different people. Um, but you know, certainly, certainly, um, working on that. I'll mention too, just if for FYI, and it's not my place to really give any updates, there's not a lot to give, but we are still working hard on the Dundalk, uh, new bills. Um, you might have noticed in the paper, there was a media release that went out that um, Alan Madden, who is our CEO, has now stepped down and aside. So he's staying um, part of this uh, project for Dundalk, um, working on getting the approvals done, et cetera, with his contacts. And so kind of feet on the ground, executive director now is Alex Hector. So um, that's still moving forward and moving ahead. Um, and we can, I can, if anyone has questions, I can certainly bring them back or get, um, get you in touch with the, with the, um, with who need, who can answer your questions. Right. Wow. That's really great. I'm, I'm so impressed again at uh, what you're doing. That's, that's really special. Uh, I'll go back to my question. Muriel, you have a question. Go ahead. Yes. Um, Actually, it came from Barb partly, because um, I was talking to her at the post office the other day. <laughs> um, Barb Rowe, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it had to, um, well, my question is, do you, are you responsible for overseeing home care? For what was the word, what home care? Home care, just, yeah. Like just in general? Yes. And then also, um, I think Barb's question was, what about um, um, linkages or access with practical supports like housekeeping, house and uh, food services? I, and besides what you were talking about with Yum, but like yeah. in-home, I guess, um, food support, um, maybe yard work, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So 
I just wrote down your question here. So no, we're not responsible for home care. Home care is still run through the former CCAC, Community Care Access Centre, okay. which was kind of dissolved into the, the LIN, which is kind of confusing because the LIN was the funding body and they kind of became one. Um, so they call they call themselves kind of LIN, LIN workers or, or community care workers. They're still tasked with going out and doing kind of an assessment to see how much need of care you have. They do a little bit of a score. Um, if things change, if you end up hospitalized, they could revisit that. Um, and then they decide on what your score is and how much home care. Do you need a bath once a week? Um, do you need help every day to get out of bed? You know, and you're fine once you're up and going, but it's just that. And, and so they kind of, or do you need support with taking certain medications or do you have a wound that needs in in home care they look at all of that they look at the psw care in the home they look at specialized nursing they look at um, social work visits they look at um uh you know a whole myriad of things and then they'll put a package together and some of it's time limited but they're the ones that are really tasked with that there has been a lot of discussion um, in the media and in other areas with this new Ontario health teams that are kind of merging. And there's lots of conversation about home care and some waste in the system and how we can do things more efficiently. So there could come a time when, when primary care and home care works a little bit closer together, um, but that's really going to depend on what uh, direction uh, Ontario Health Gray Bruce is gonna take and we're, what's determined to be the need and where the focus can be. So it's going to be really, um, it's going to be really kind of a, um, a shared decision between all the sectors, the hospital sector, the community sector, primary care sector, long-term care sector, everyone's going to kind of come together and decide how they're going to manage that. And you, as you can imagine, that, that that's not going to be an easy feat. So um, it is status quo for now for, for home care. In terms of the housekeeping services, um, one thing we would do is we'd probably refer somebody to, again, home and community support services. So they're really the ones that do the, the Meals on Wheels, they're the ones that do the um, the tra like the transportation. And I know that um, Colleen Benninger, Muriel, um, she's on our Council on Aging as a representation. Um, Mur uh, Colleen or, or, or someone else would probably be a good person to come and maybe present at one time because they do do things like housekeeping. They do, you can kind of um, pay a, a small rate for people to come in because when you when you ask CCAC to come in, they're they're there for personal care reasons. They're not gonna, you know, maybe somebody might go and help you with the kitty litter, but really they're there to give you personal care. So people need that extra piece of stuff. And so home and community support services really has a whole selection of things that they can um, provide. And part of our job with that food coordination, like I said before, food banks, um, Meals on Wheels. There's lots of private private companies that, that have frozen meals programs, um, home, heart to home meals. Um, Chef Gilles up in Meaford has been working with churches and trying to get free meals down as well. So it's about trying to coordinate that. What's the best thing for this client? Where can we direct them? Do they have money to perhaps um, pay for these systems and then we can save these meals for people who can't? Like we had an instance where a, a, a client could pay but um, she had just spent, um, her husband passed away. And again, no, there was no funeral, no family could kind of come up. Um, and she was just, you know, how do I get by in the next little bit in terms of food? Like there wasn't the traditional piece of um, kind of support for meals. So really the yum helped kind of get her through that first week or two and after she said you know i don't need this anymore but thank you for getting me through that time and i actually like to donate back to the program or maybe i'd like to volunteer um so really kind of that community oriented approach um and sometimes we see people being discharged from the hospital and we can help out you know short term with meals but it's all about need and Who's the best to serve? And so um, if we ever kind of step on toes or we are being redundant in services, we need to know that because we certainly want to redirect our resources because you know we don't have a lot. We want to make sure we're filling a need. So in any event, and even with programs, Muriel or, or anybody on the line today or, or who, who listens to this after, we need to hear from the community about what the needs are because that's what we're really um, interested in meeting the need. And, sorry guys. I have two Maine Coon cats, and I don't know if you know what Maine Coons are, but they're getting really excitable because I'm here talking, um, and they're not feeling <laughs> themselves right now. Um, oh. Sorry. 
Okay. Um, so would, yeah, would you? I would really, I really encourage anybody to reach out and let us know if they recognize the needs in the community because we really have kind of been able to press restart and a, a fresh kind of go forward with 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 COVID. Now we can kind of start populating maybe Erskine with programs um, or an outreach down again to um, our, the Optimist Center. Like what what is the need and how can we fill that? Sure. Would you be willing to send me the name and contact information for that lady you mentioned from Community Care? Um, sure. From Colleen, I think Muriel might have it. You have yeah, it? Yeah, I, I, mean, I would have it. Yes, I would have it. Yes. Okay. I, I yeah. think it'd be uh, really helpful to, to yeah. have her come and, and speak with us. Okay. That's super, Tanya. It's really, really interesting. A anyone else have uh, questions for Tanya? Okay, so I'm beginning to understand just a little bit your role and then the community role. And, and I, I thinking the community role is more private driven, right, than, than public. And so it's a little more disjointed or, or not financially when, supported. Or When you say community role, what do you mean specifically? Well, I was talking about the, uh, the, the home care and, and uh, people coming in to, to help uh, someone who's not totally disabled but needs a bit of help around the house like muriel said you know with the uh the, the garbage or the food or you know uh, gardening well, there, and there's something. both so ccac or the lynn workers the community care workers it's tax-based it's fu it's funded if somebody's going to oh, pay for is. someone to come into your home every single day that's free that's part of our, our health care system if oh, it's not okay. enough and sometimes people are kind of teetering on whether or not they need what they call 24-hour care. So whether they're yes. going to need to go into long-term care. Sometimes there's a little bit of a period where they need enhanced care. And family will sometimes go to private pay places to have someone come in and augment what's there. But definitely those um, housekeeping and those things is kind of out of pocket. Um, but I wouldn't even classify home and community support as a private business because they are no. um, funded okay. heavily through the LIN as well. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. All right. Anyone else have anything? Okay. Well, look, Tanya, I'd really like to thank you so much for taking the time. Come and speak with us and uh, good luck with everything going forward. Okay. Thanks, everybody. You're welcome. You're welcome Enjoy to the rest of your meeting. It's nice to see okay. your face for change. Bye. <laughs> I know. We'll look forward to that open house there invitation. Uh, let's see, see what you guys are continue to be up with, up to. All right, thank you. Okay, that was really good. Uh, I was so impressed with the range of programs that they offer. They're just so dynamic. All right, so um, the next item is number six, and it's adoption of the minutes. Uh, they were circulated some time ago and again recently. Does anyone have any any additions or corrections or changes? Okay, would someone like to move that the adoption of the minutes from our uh, June meeting? I'm moving. Okay, Catherine, thank you. And seconder? I'll second. Okay, thank you, Arlene. All right. Staff update. Okay, Arlene, I'm very happy to um, to have you speak to us a bit more about uh, Abbey Field. Uh, I know questions about housing for seniors as as they age, they they need different options, and I think Abbey Field is is a very interesting idea and. Uh, and it's operating, which is wonderful. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about it and your residents and how it was funded and how it continues. Right now so, it's operating on the high side, which is very nice. Because right it, now it is what? I missed that, sorry. Well, we're operating on the high side because sometimes we've had trouble getting residents in. Oh, right. I see, okay. So just to explain, I don't know how much people know. So there's one in Durham, one in Caledon, one in Toronto, Lakefield, BC, High River. It's all, there's 20 across Canada in total. It's also in Australia, Belgium, Jersey, New Zealand, South Africa. So it's basically all around the world. 
So Abbeyfield has about 15 people at the moment, which is nice to have. And it's basically, um, I'm going to read here. Maybe I should know it, but I don't. So it, it's basically administered out of Ottawa. So they have a, a group there, and it's run by volunteer boards of directors in most cases. And that's been one H of a challenge during COVID. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, well, things that we found out. So we were trying to get the Abbey Field people vaccinated. The first time around, they had a clinic in Durham, so they went. Second time around, I called up to Owen Sound actually on the Monday, and I couldn't get an answer about whether they were having another clinic. And there was one lady there, and her dad was in. Anyway, long story short, she booked her dad. So I went and got on the phone, and an hour and 15 minutes later, I had everybody else booked. But we had to go to Hanover. We could not get somebody in. And we were told that we couldn't get somebody in for the second time because we didn't get somebody in for the first. But there's also, I think, you have to be licensed. We are not licensed. So we don't have an on-premises nurse. I think that's what the licensing incorporates. So with that, anyway, long story short, they all got vaccinated. They were all happy. They didn't have to get out of the cars when they went to Hanover. So we were all happy getting that done. But it just was a in a way a huge challenge because they're starting to listen to the news they're all over 80 it's like it's okay it's our turn and they they had to wait three months to get that second vaccination so they were getting a little antsy but anyway they were all happy in the end they got, got the vaccination but it, they had less problem i heard less complaints from everybody in abbey field than i heard about a whole bunch of, from a lot of other people that seemed to have complaints i think they were so thankful we did that so, guiding principles. So, Abbey Fields, their mandate is to provide affordable accommodation, companionship for lonely elders within their local community. It's achieved by converting and maintaining houses in which typically a small group of residents live together with the house manager. So, the um, Abbey Field in Durham was built to be an Abbey Field. But what they're doing now in some cases is they're incorporating, so they're maybe getting old buildings so they can maybe have some stores on the bottom, some apartments in part of it, and then have Abbey Field in part of it. So, and that to me would be nice because you've got sort of more of a mix. Uh, okay, so living in Abbey Field basically. So they have, so houses are wheelchair accessible. It says ab, uh, elevators in place where needed. So we have an elevator in Durham because it's two floors. Parking is provided at most houses. Each tenant has their own room and a bathroom. Some, there's actually about four or five at Abbey Field in Durham that have a double room. The, the rooms aren't huge. So we have a, like a couple of common areas, but their own rooms are not huge. So they, if it's a husband and wife and some people on their own just prefer to have the two rooms. So they're responsible for furnishing their suites and Abbey Field was responsible for common areas. So they have a private locker so they can keep things in. They, they're responsible for phone, TV, internet, all that kind of thing. So we run, basically they have our so Abbey Field in Durham is run by we have host parents so we have three host parents that interchange that cover off the days and we have one person that's staying overnight so everybody operates that part differently at one point they had sort of a house parent coordinator that was there all the time but right now they don't do that so we have an overnight person <clears throat> So they get breakfast, lunch, and, and the main meal is served at what I would call lunchtime, and, and the evening meal is a, a smaller meal, lots of beverages, snacks. <coughs> Excuse me. So costs vary from house to house. I think ours are not necessarily, or the Abbey Field in Durham is not necessarily that cheap, but like everybody's saying, the cost of food is going up, the cost, you know, taxes, everything else, so that the costs basically have to go up. Uh, Residents, and I guess it's like a lot of other places because to me, um, 
the mix has changed. So I'm not on the board anymore. I was on the board for about four years and I'm not on anymore. But, you know, like just people going in and out, different things happening, that type of thing. So the mix has changed and also COVID's in there. They haven't been able to see their relatives and stuff like that. So it's been, uh, there isn't, I don't think a senior's home that wouldn't have been in pretty rough shape at some point during all of this. <clears throat> And so the the type of the type of people that uh, that move into Abbey Field would be seniors that uh, want some support in living, like because, uh, the meals school. and everything. We Go have ahead. A lady that 105 at Christmas time this year. So she actually was uh, her husband that sort of started it all, the one in Durham. And some of them, like they, they don't want to live alone anymore. They're kind of, most of them are over 80. We have uh, one or two that are under 80, but most are over 80. And, you know, they, they don't want to cook. They don't want to have to shop. Some of them aren't driving anymore. There's, you know, been a few that they're licensed. They're, they're not driving anymore, so they don't have the access that they did before. They do have scooters. Quite a few of them have scooters, so they can get into town. Scooters. Oh yeah, of course. Okay. They scooters, so they, you know, can boot around town. But but that to me with COVID was like, I can't handle this. <laughs> because most right. of them are hard of hearing, so five seat isn't five seat. Right, right. But anyway, right. like um, I think both I would think all three. So Serenity up at the top of the hill, Abbey Field, and um what's the other one, the bigger one? Anyway, oh, nobody had uh, any kind of break. <laughs> so okay, that's, that's what I'm thinking of. So nobody had an outbreak, which was very good. We operated, we Excellent. basically asked the people at the beginning. So they did not want, we got ready for them to eat in their rooms. And they didn't oh, want to okay. keep that. Oh, really? Okay. Really hard on people. So they, they basically stayed their own sort of cohort. And, uh, you know, things worked well. We kept, like, PSWs and all kinds of that were, PSWs could come in, but some of the other aides, like, they couldn't get their hair cut any more than we could, and why should they? <laughs> was my question, but, you know, just that kind of thing. They they had to uh, kind of hold back on that, but, no, I, I think they've been, you know, it, it's just been a tough goal for anybody that was older, I think, so it, and it, it yeah. didn't matter where you were. Right. So I don't know if anybody has any questions. So um, do you don't go ahead. Yeah, the, uh, the there's no nursing care per se. Like if the needle if needle injections need to be given or something or management of uh, pills or whatever. You you don't that's offer we that. Do. Yeah, we don't do that and that's I okay. think how it ended up with the, the non-licensing. Now we do have um one of the doctors at the hospital, her mother used to live at Abbey Field, so she'd come over and, and like the doctors do come over and make house calls, that kind of thing. But we don't do it, like we don't touch that kind of thing. We don't help. And, you know, sure, the odd person gets a little help with her pills, but basically we don't do it. Okay, okay. So for people who were relatively well and, and autonomous that yeah. can... Uh, can move into Abbey Field, and once they get too ill yeah. then, and need more support, then there has to be another option. They right. go to Rockwood. Right. It's just down the street. Rockwood. That's the name of it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's that's the next step. There's all kinds of steps in this process. And, and it? really, that's oh, what's happening. This. You know? So it's, it's a convenient if you make a decision, you're not really quite ready for Rockwood, but you think you could go to Abbey Field. And I don't think there's a whole, like Rockwood to me is bigger. And obviously, it's got, you know, like, I would, uh, I don't know if I'd call them perks, but they can get entertainment. We only have about 12 people. And if they, you know, half of them don't want to come out if you get somebody to come and sing or something or play music, it's not yeah. too much. Yeah. But it's not an institution. The doors aren't locked, per se. I mean, people can feel at home and comfortable there, right? Yeah. Like, well, the outside doors, like when you say the doors aren't locked, the outside door is locked and, and stuff like that. But no, most of them do oh, not lock. But the challenge okay. is when you get new people in, then there's a trust challenge for a while. 
<laughs> oh, I see. They don't okay. necessarily know. Quite a few people know each other, but some of them don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And if family come to visit, is there a, a room where they could stay, or is uh, would say they're know, coming from right afar? Now, right now, I think it's full, but there used okay. to be a room. Like one lady, her daughter used to come from out west, and there would, would be an extra room. And the overnight right. person they have a room for that person to do that. But I think right yeah. now. Okay. Okay. All right. Does anyone have questions for Arlene about Abbey Field? Anybody want to move in? We'll put you on the list. <laughs> you have you want you're starting a waiting list, are you? That's what, the, well, you know what, that's the smartest thing that we could do was to finally get something like that going. So we did kind of get to the point that we had a waiting list because at one point we were just, it wasn't fun. You know, when you're a not-for-profit, you're a not-for-profit. So it's like, okay, right. then you can get right. a little tough. They okay. don't change the taxes and things because you're, you're not-for-profit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. And can... Yeah, do the do the residents have input about the meals or whatever or but it's the volunteers that do all the cooking right no 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 paid staff paid staff kitchen oh, staff. paid staff okay so they have it's some staff. training and whatever so have, yeah they all have to have their safe food certificate so you ask the oh, residents okay. if they want to change and like really i i did that i don't know how many times oh no everything's fine okay <laughs> But no, like everybody has a twist. So everybody, you know, if three different people make lasagna, they kind of make their own lasagna recipe. And that sort of gives them a bit of variety that way. But no, there's quite a bit of variety in the food choices. That they yeah, yeah, okay, all right, good. Does anyone have questions for Arlene about uh, Abbey Field? If you want okay. to um, is, there, is there an age? Um, limit like you said most of the people are over 80 like is most are, but we have that the a, a couple of people now that are 70 ish and i don't think you'd want to be any less than 70 you know because okay. then you have 10 or 12 people basically the same age group and stuff and then you kind of put you know you wouldn't want to be 60 and move there particularly but it would depend on your needs <coughs> excuse me and like I said, one's going to be 105. 105. Wow. Around Christmas time. Okay. How long has it been operating, Arlene? Ooh. When did it, it open? Do you know? 15 years. 13, Six 14, years? 15, no, 13, 14, 15 years, somewhere in there. It's okay. Been wow. Okay. All right. So the building was purchased by the Abbey Field Group or and then built. renovated built. to accommodate it your No, it was built. It was built. Oh, it was built to yeah, to yeah. To, yeah. to be a, that and kind it, of home. We did the 105. It was her husband that sort of came up with the initial idea and plan and got people together. <clears throat> wow. So it worked out well cuz she's still there. Wow, that's great, eh? doesn't want okay. to go. <laughs> All right. Anyone else have any uh, questions for Arlene? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Arlene. Uh, I know we went to an open house once and, and everyone seemed really friendly and welcoming and, uh, and it seemed like a really nice environment. So it's another option, isn't it? As you age, if you don't yeah, want to stay do, alone. They do have things for, so actually last year, I'll just do it quickly. Um, they used to have a Christmas party, and then last year we couldn't do that. So right. they got on Zoom. So it was absolute, like, actually, it was better than a Christmas party because everybody could see everybody's kids. So it's like, oh, that's my son, and he lives over here, and that's my daughter, and she lives in D.C. Oh, so it's not that good. Of, like, it was really nice to see. You know, they were, they were kind of interacting. Yeah. And like, what's this one? And, you know, so it was really great. Yeah. So there can be options if you want, eh? Okay. All right. Um, on zoom they, like they did do some stuff on zoom for them so they were quite happy yeah okay all right well thank you thank you that's great good information okay do do we need to do anything Lindsay? <laughs> no not you're for my, that one Allie. you're my director all right that's great thank you all right so next on the list is uh mr david milner welcome welcome 
So uh, you're go wanted to report on affordable, attainable housing committee. Good, we'd like to hear about that. Okay, Dave will do, Ellie. It's the mister was my father, I think. Uh, but <laughs> oh, anyway. was it? Oh, Dave will do, okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> anyway, uh, we uh, put in place an affordable housing um, committee and we've changed the name to affordable, attainable housing committee. This is a, oh, a name that has many definitions sometimes. So, uh, and some people don't like that term and they use the word economical. So it depends who you talk to, but we named it the Southgate Affordable Attainable Housing Advisory Committee. And uh, the members are Jerry McNulty and Muriel Scott. They both applied. And then we had to do some, uh, I guess, uh, tooth pulling and Recru we recruited more people. and. Morgan McCannell, a young person in the community, is uh, is on the committee and been appointed. Jan Powell and Jennifer DeYoung. Jennifer's uh, yes. in in the Agermont area, so they have representation yeah. across the community. Michael Shearson and Martin Shipston, as who will be a, are appointed as councillors, and Mayor Woodbury will be on as an ex officio member. Um, I actually talked to Jerry today, and there's actually some meetings going on with uh, some of the members. You know just kind of talking and sharing ideas and discussing this whole thing and, and it's it's a big issue um we're going to uh, have have our initial meeting in september and uh bring together people virtually and have uh, maybe some initial uh, uh discussions with people sorry in the industry um as far as uh, developers uh planners and so on I, I think it's important to talk uh with the planners we're in the middle of official plan review so we'll be looking at creative ways to change our official plan so that we can do some accommodation of uh, tiny homes or whatever uh, and see if those are solutions economic development and planning are also working on uh, um, a mo modular home i would call it a uh, trailer um, park uh, there's a developer interested in doing that in the community so i see that as a, a good uh, entry level or retirement uh, transition type of arrangement uh, because it makes it very affordable that they can lease land and lease uh, water access and sewage disposal and yet uh, decide on the type of uh, uh, modular or trailer type home that they may want to bring into the property so we'll have those discussions and I think this is a multi-pronged uh, solution that's going to have to take place. Um, you know, the price of homes has uh, got a little bit outrageous, but uh, and and rent. So we just have to find uh, ways that uh, we can work with developers and and find homes that um, people can get into um, affordably. So um, we'll see how it goes. Uh, the first meeting will review our reference and uh, make changes to it as we see necessary. Uh, do some, like I said, to have the planner attend just to do some introductions on, you know, what the the changes maybe that we could look at with planning and uh, then have a discussion of what future meetings will look like and who we want need to talk to. Any questions okay. there? Well, that, that, that sounds really encouraging. Uh, you're right, the price of homes is, someone who's uh, working every day at, at minimum wage or market just can't get into the market you know and and there are alternatives and when i was younger we did live in a mobile home uh, mobile home park and you know it was a great place for my sons it was safe uh, they could ride their bikes uh, it was a it was a nice community and uh, i think if standards and it's well managed it can be quite a quite a good uh, uh, option. Uh, anyone have questions for Dave? Nice to see you're on the committee, Muriel. That's really good. I just wanted to ask about that. I hadn't heard that we were confirmed as members. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had you not signed up? <laughs> Well, I, I applied my, but I also indicated that the other member, if there were other applications uh, accepted, and they had too many. I well, I didn't actually write this exactly like this, but 
but I'd be happy to just be on the sidelines supporting the work. <laughs> Anyways, right? I, I believe oh, I, I believe there's the letters are in the mail. I know one person's already got their letter, and that okay. would be just because uh, the efficiency of the post office uh, getting some people faster than others. But uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Okay, well, thank you. Um, and and there, they say the other, sorry, as they say, the checks in the mail. <laughs> Um, well, and just to, to clarify, like some of the newer people we'd approached, I think they're interested, but I didn't, I wasn't sure if they'd actually put applications in, but I guess they have then, which is great. Okay. <laughs> I'd just like to mention, I came across this report, uh, Aging at Well, by uh, some professors at Queen's University. And uh, it's, it's a little bit political, but at the same time, it's really quite interesting in terms of uh, progression of uh, living for uh, for seniors and some of the things they they talk about is uh, granny flats and I don't know if the township approved the uh, existence of uh, granny flats uh, it could be a part of the home but it could also be a small home uh, on the same property and I, I don't know if that that that's allowed yeah. or yeah granny flats are are in our policies now that uh, okay okay and they're usually they're usually time sensitive that they may be approved for a 10 or 20 year period okay um, for sure but yeah yeah it uh yeah we have those yeah. now yeah another uh another suggestion for uh, for housing it would be communal communal living Oasis Communal Living in Kingston have a have a program. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. There's another option for intergenerational mixed housing, where a senior might have an extra bedroom or two and might uh, have a student come and stay. And in exchange for a bit of housework or maybe gardening and shoveling uh, snow, uh, they can have a reduced rate for their room. Uh, home sharing program, senior friendly villages is an option. Apparently these are growing in the UK, so it's kind of interesting. Um, well, those, and then of course, long-term care and, and hospital care, but there are some interesting options, I think, once you start looking into it. Muriel. Yep. Just where was that um, publication from? University of Waterloo, was Queen. it? Yeah, I'll send you the report if you like. Okay, it's yes. really quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like it has a good summary. That's right. Yeah, it was just too long to to print off. So, Thanks. okay. Well, that, that's encouraging, Dave. Uh, I I understand the, these two folks, Jerry and and Muriel, came across the need when they they were working volunteering at the food bank. Is is how did it come about? Um, about the Mary committee. Redmond, Mary Redmond, oh, was yes, the yes, of the Herald, and she and her husband uh, managed the the uh, the uh, food bank here in in um, town in Dundalk. Um, right. Oh, they but, do. okay. Yeah, yeah. So Mary's really our spearheader with this, <laughs> but okay. she didn't feel that she could apply to be on the committee. Um, no, she's but, not on the committee yet. <laughs> No, but she and Charles, her husband, um, you know, they're the ones that they're the first line of, of approach when um, people call for help with the food bank. And, um, you know, they've just been really good at getting to know their people. Um, so it was really Mary that started the discussions and but it was around Christmas time. Um, yeah, so she was talking with Jerry, she was talking with me and we eventually started having phone meetings. So we've been doing that ever since, every two or three weeks. And we've talked to all kinds of other people in the meantime, too. <laughs> and what interested the the uh, township uh, particularly, Dave, in this? Well, yeah, this has been a discussion ongoing for years. I mean, this is not oh. uh, localized to Southgate. We're not, uh, you oh, know, I'm the, sure. the only people. I mean, this, this problem is countrywide maybe even worldwide uh, mm -hmm. definitely in canada we've got a huge problem with the way pricing has escalated you know we've had discussions over the years with 
developers about you know price points and you know the cost of building materials is just ridiculous so we have to look at it in another way of uh, uh you know of more affordable smaller homes uh like these tiny homes they talk about and i think yeah. there's another situation too is maybe you know having uh some support services for financial management because you know to financially manage that kind of debt load is, is a pretty big deal so you know back you know when some of us on the call here maybe not lindsay or holly but um bought our houses we didn't have internet bills and uh all these other ancillary bills that uh, you know, the phone you know are we reached out the wind and turn a pipe that turned the antenna on top of the house to turn to tune into ccnn <laughs> um but with all the 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 services that we have a lot of consumable income is taken up by that before we get started paying for you know those equity pieces and homes and so on so i think financial management and and maybe uh you know looking at service providers bundling services and for a community mm. there are things we can look at before we even start in the housing but the housing is is where it ends up that how do we get people into a house rather than paying rent right right i can't manage okay that's interesting any anyone have uh, other questions for dave okay well thank you very much dave it's good to get uh uh an update on that and and certainly applicable to uh to seniors and what options there might be for seniors all right okay are you you all set dave did you have anything else you want to add or no i'll talk later maybe about a couple of things in new business um okay okay yeah that's fine okay oh, muriel yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I was just wondering, Dave, can you just give us a bit of an update on the uh, seniors apartment building? I actually drove down there and it's up. <laughs> yes, yeah. it is. And uh, so the seniors apartment building is well on its way. Uh, there is, and I, I don't know if there's been a public announcement, but there's going to be an open house down there. And then in the, in the, uh, I believe it'll be a Saturday. But I, I'll stand corrected on that. But just watch the Dundalk Herald for that kind of announcement. Um, yeah, they've they've sold a lot of the the rental unit, or when I say sold, they've they've uh, a lot of the rental units are under contract. But uh, they're continuing to do that. It's well on its way for construction. I haven't heard an exact date of uh, when it will be. You know, kind of christen the the hall, but. Uh, it's it's i know he's planning on opening as soon as the construction and trades can get the the work done there's been delays because of covid and so just i would just say stay tuned um you know maybe for the next meeting i'll try and get some um increased information or we could have somebody come in but definitely attend that event um there'll be people there you know offering the uh the service to the community Thank you. Oh, that's great. Yeah, they've done that pretty quickly all the same, eh? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. Anyone else have anything for Dave right now? Okay. All right. So we'll move on to our brochure. Time time is moving on, so maybe we'll make this this quick. Uh Barbara Dobreen kindly um offered a few uh, points about uh Mm, grammar and uh, uh, other other issues, and and I know one of the things you mentioned, Dave, was how we wanted to um, to use this brochure. And what came to mind when I was speaking with Tanya, it, or when Tanya was speaking to us, was that maybe this this document can be a, a resource in terms of giving people uh, contacts if they want extra services uh you know it can be useful in that way instead of just um just advertising about what we do yeah but that might be helpful wouldn't it dave to have some sure. contacts sure. or if you need help with this yeah. and community services are here and there and of course once we open up we can have the the brochure available to people who you know attend our events or even at the the township office but i think being that kind of resource 
what, what do you think, Catherine? Ka Ka we had talked about it and I, I really hadn't done anything and uh, Catherine was the one that initiated it and really, really appreciate it. It's beautifully done. Uh, again, content is, is up for discussion, but what do you think, uh, Catherine? about adding those kind of that kind of information so that we become uh, a bit of a, a resource. Uh. Yeah, well, when putting it up, actually, I was trying to look at where what numbers we could put in there. So I just, you know, of course, yeah, yeah. Uh, we haven't discussed yet. Yeah, yeah. Good idea. Okay, so you kind of have that in mind anyway, right? Okay. Um, Yes, Dave. I guess I'll ask the committee, what is the goal of the brochure? Because uh, uh, is it just to communicate uh, what you're looking at doing for the next year? Or is it a bit of a, a changing newsletter? Or what are you thinking from the standpoint of its, uh, its uh, usefulness? Because right. I think it's a great idea. I think it's it's been a little difficult because we haven't been able to meet as a committee. Some of our ladies, as you see, are just not technically comfortable to, to log on. And when I speak to them, they're certainly interested in continuing participation and want to be uh, get the news. But this kind of meeting isn't helpful. So, and we haven't been able to really thrash it out. Uh, and and I think that would be something that we would uh, we would need to do in the near future before we publish it. Would you agree, Catherine, that we we need to discuss further use what you have as a basis, and then uh, continue to uh, to look at ways to make this a useful tool for our community that we could send out. Yeah, it could be like a baseline brochure, or it could be. You know, maybe tailored to different events, you know, or for yeah. information of, of how they contact us. Do you think, um, are we able to meet yet, Dave? Like, could we have a meeting at the library, say, you know, in a month's time with our, we could rent so, some space there or so, use some well, space? And... Yeah, don't, don't, let's not use the word rent. I mean, we'll definitely, but I would say yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, you're a committee of council, so you get uh, you get freebies and we'll we'll open up space but the library wouldn't be a good place it's it's pretty congested now because of social distancing and everything but if there's a group of you want to get together um definitely we'd make the uh, McIntyre building where there's lots of open space to you know for social distancing and, and safeguards if you want um so that's all I'm thinking when I speak about the brochure is I'm just wondering if it would be a great tool for half of it to be your message as a group and the other half to be maybe it be updated quarterly and I could uh, provide some staff like our our EDO I think these are the kind of things our, our economic development officer could be involved in in promoting some of your programs and what you're doing and support you and the other half of the newsletter could be that quarterly communications that we post on our website or that you guys individually have just to hand out to, you know, fellow uh, seniors or other people in the community, put it in our library as a pickup item. But that's just, I'm throwing that out for thought and discussion. I think I like those thoughts um, because I, I think we definitely need something that profiles, not just this advisory committee, but seniors. In, the, in Southgate and to make people aware that there is a committee that's acting on their behalf. Because my guess is most people don't know that or don't realize how important it could be to them. Yes. Um, and, and, and to just jump off what you're saying there is like right now, Southgate as an entity, we're having problems keeping up with all the COVID communication stuff that's coming at us. And I, I just imagine there's seniors out there sitting in their houses and they're just totally lost. They have no idea, but these rules are changing. I mean, are we, you know, a month or more ago, there wasn't any idea of a health passport or a vaccination passport or vaccination mm -hmm. card um, on the radar. And now they're talking about it because everyone else is doing it. Um, you know, and what privilege will that give you or what restriction will that have if you don't have one? Um, yeah. And you know what 
what is coming because um a lot of people you know we hear it because we get updated fairly frequently at least every two weeks or every week by dr era but he's very concerned about a, a second or a, sorry a second a fourth sorry, wave fourth. coming yeah. with the delta variant and uh you know then the balancing act between the level of vaccinations if we get to 90 percent, that would be a good thing if we're only at 80 it won't be so good so uh um anyway and, and we're hearing different things about uh you know um about employees and restricting employees if they don't have vaccinations if they we think there's a threat and there's all kinds of stuff going on there but uh by far we are not out of the woods yet and i think that's the big message that uh you know if you want to protect yourself and be safe we still need to you know social distance wear masks you know and wash hands and do all those things they're saying but I guess my message is I'm saying all that, but a lot of people aren't getting, there's a lot of stuff in the news that uh, may be misleading. And if we were you know, to concisely frame it and it's coming from the seniors committee, then it would be you know, accurate good information that they would likely trust. Yeah, and I think we've got, there's so much on the go in the township at this point, not not just this township, but others too. But I think of the um, age friendly community planning and the uh, well, the, the Southgate's uh, community improvement plan, all of those things. Um, they're dealing with lots of things that seniors are interested in as well as everybody else. And I just think, you know, it's just uh, we really need to be involved. We don't have all the answers, but we sure want to be able to ask the questions and uh, give our two cents worth. <laughs> yep. Ellie, I don't think we can hear you unless that's just on my end. Yeah, I can't hear her either. Try to no, we can't hear you. It looks like you're unmuted, but we can't hear. Do we want to go to the next item while we wait for Ellie to figure that out? You might have to leave and come back in, Ellie. Can anybody lip read? She's saying some stuff, but. I think she's locked up. I think she's locked up. She's not moving yeah. now. Yeah. Time's up. <laughs> you want to do want to just lead until she comes back, Lindsay, or or somebody well, want to take the chair? A, no, we don't have a quorum now. We have to wait. Oh, right, 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 right. Well, Ellie's the fourth person we can see her. She's quorum. No. <laughs> Maybe we could just we'll call. Dismiss. Yes. Ellie, if you can hear us there, she's done something. Can you can you hear us, Ellie? Maybe if you talk without your uh, video on, you'll get more bandwidth. That's not working. Yeah. She might be going out and coming back in though. Oh. Yeah. There she is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that better? Oh, there you go. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Okay. You're alive and kicking. There we go. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Good. So, um, wh where were we? Can we go to the Great County Age Friendly? Had just started talking about that. No, we okay. hadn't, but we can go there, I think. 
Right. I am very impressed with um, with what's happening. Oh, my reboot is acting up. Sorry about that. I've got this stuff going on. Sorry. Okay. Um, color your way. I, and I think Muriel's been excellent at keeping us informed and in what's going on with the Council on Aging. I really appreciate that. Um, I'd like to continue to support uh, the Gray County efforts. And uh, one way we can do that. Now, Mira, were you able to participate uh, this morning, the 9 to 11, on the no, webinar? Tomorrow morning. Oh, oh, sorry. Right. Um, oh, it's tomorrow morning. You're, no, you're right. right. You're no, right. It's today. Today. one this morning. And no, I, I wasn't able to participate this morning. But, but tomorrow okay. morning is the Council on Aging session. Right, right, right. Okay. And then there's a couple of other dates, August 21st and August 26th. And um, the, the, they're having some workshops and some some live uh, discussions, and I, I think I think they're excellent. Um, so I'd like to keep in, uh, be aware of what they are doing and and support them as best we can. So you're saying the Council on Aging is yeah. talking like about this plan, are they? Yeah, our regular meeting, telephone meeting, is tomorrow morning. That's the monthly right. one. Um, but they're using um, the time from 10 to 12. The meetings don't usually go that long. But from 10 to 12 is what they're calling a workshop. But it's specifically for counseling on counsel on aging people to give input into this into this planning. Um, and you're all right. welcome to join in um, if you wish with it's that online. meeting tomorrow. Pardon me? Oh, okay. It's online, is it? Virtual? Oh, this, this one's a phone meeting. Uh, you phone in. So you oh. have that information uh, in one of the emails. It would be like the, I don't remember what it's called, but it's like the Council on Aging's regular monthly meeting invitation. Um, okay. The other one is um, the Gray County uh, Actual Planning Committee. And um, uh, we know Pam McDermott because she has presented yes. to us. She is actually mm -hmm. the Council on Aging's rep uh, to that okay. um, age-friendly committee. Oh, so, good. Okay. Um, yeah. So that, that's what would have been this morning. That would have been the first workshop that they're planning with, with uh, like public input. And then there's the three mm -hmm. more, like you were saying. Right. Okay. Yeah. Did anyone else participate this morning? No. Okay. No. Okay. Um, pa Pam had uh, sent out. I don't know if you received it. Some uh, that because the Gray County uh, Planning Committee are looking for input, and Pam has almost two pages of information that she feels is helpful. And one of the things just strikes me, and she's saying, you know, it, it's hard to get rid of possessions. What do you do with them? Where do you send them? And what came to mind, uh, some municipalities do have a, a pickup day uh, once a year or maybe twice for, you know, old fridges and old freezers and old couches you don't want anymore. And uh, Dave, do, does uh, Southgate have such a plan? Maybe they do, no. but I don't know. No, we don't. Um, for those big items at curbside, we just stick to the, the uh, waste uh, carts. Um, right. We've pretty good luck with neighbors helping out other people to do that. Right. Uh, you see, I mean, you see the odd time on some roads, uh, more county roads, that people put something out and say, basically free or or whatever, and that works too. But yeah, it does work. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot of it's a lot of labor involved in doing those kind of pickups. Um, right. Right. But it's and just we've got a lot of, we've got a lot of roads to cover too. <laughs> right. It's just an interesting idea how seniors get get stuck with things, you know, and don't have options, you know, and 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 that that one particularly. Uh, so she's she's uh she's going to be uh, giving them uh, suggestions, um, and that she mentions too about the the new bus system and the transportation, and 
you know, the ideas are great. People are trying, but how does a senior with a disability get to the bus stop if they don't have a lift to get there? You know, like this, there's different levels of, of challenges for seniors continuing to live in their own homes. So maybe I'll just speak to that Ellie, a wee bit about the transportation because that's a that's a good comment. Um, our okay. transportation up and down Highway 10 has been very successful to the kind of that oh, Dundalk Orangeville route. Uh, it's the highest consumption route between Owen Sound and uh, Orangeville that we have in the in Great County. Oh, and there's also great. one that goes from Owen Sound to Guelph out of uh, Owen Sound that runs as well. That's a city of own sound initiative, but uh, they're you know they're they're fun focused together. Um, if there's people with disabilities, they should call the smart transit service. They will pick people up the, do up the door and provide that service. If you know if they're adequately disabled and need that kind of service, you know there's a cost and it's but it's highly subsidized. And uh, but anyway, it it's a service that could be considered. Okay, that sounds good. That would be something we could put in our brochure too, you know, some of the services that are available for seniors yes. that uh, they don't know. Because if you never had to use them, you kind of don't know where to go. So uh, yeah. th I think that kind of information would be helpful. Okay. Um, did anyone have uh, anything uh, else to add about the, uh, the Gray County? Oh, Planning, what are they called again? Uh, age friendly age. community plan, yeah. Yeah. Does anyone have anything they wanted to add to that? I think a good start would be to participate in those webinars and, and get more information on what they're doing. And maybe some thoughts could come to mind about how we can uh, help them the most. <clears throat> Any more comments on that? Okay. Just, All right. Did did someone have something to say, Muriel? I was just going, was just going to say that, um, like, I think that you know the timing of all this planning, it it really um, it overlaps, and certainly with right. the the set the townships planning. I mean, I know there's been discussion on how to um, how to make Proton Street more accessible for people, but the Proton Street businesses and services. Um, so that's something that's very much age friendly, not just for seniors, but for others too. But um, I think there's just a lot happening and the timing is very good for our, for putting our ideas in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm impressed with everything that's going on. That's great, okay. All right, so we'll put that, leave that one aside and, and maybe bring it up again at the next meeting after uh, the webinars and Muriel's further discussion uh, with the, the Council on Aging. Okay, so we're up to number eight and that's new business. Dave, you said you had some new business. Yeah, so um, just to update you, uh, Tanya give you a bit of an update on the Dundalk Clinic. I think it's important. I'm quite heavily involved with it uh, in working with Al since he's left. Well, I've been working with Al uh, when he is with Southeast Gray and after he's left specifically on this project. He's uh, working right now on uh, about a seven step process to acquire funding. We've completed two, he's working on the third one. Um, and we're looking to do a sod turning in the next uh, 60 to 90 days at the site. Um, and part of this, uh, you know, seven stage process, we'll be getting into design and approvals and all that sort of stuff. but. I would say it would be um, be really a shock to me if we didn't start digging holes and pouring cement in 2022. So just to give you know the you know the the committee uh, some sense of uh, that's where it's looking at uh, it happening. I would say we've got a site plan. The site plan has been approved by the county because the county does own some of the land. The other thing I'm working on, and I'll be taking a report to either August 25th or, or September 1st to council to say, or to agree to an agreement. And if you know Dundalk, the rail trail goes up through the center of those properties on uh, Croton and Dundalk Street. 
and you look at it and you think it's all one of the north end near gray but it isn't it's two there's actually three properties there's one owned by gray county where the library is situated and there's one owned in the center by gray county which is the rail trail separate which will preserve for you know recreation and few, maybe future rail return and then on the west side or dundalk street side uh southgate owns that property uh, and this goes way back to the days of uh, the, when the train went through. But uh, our side on Dundalk uh, Street side or the South Gainal property, we'll be building the building there. Uh, and maybe next time I can bring, you know, we could actually bring or have talk more about the, the site plan and and you can see where we're going to uh, instruct. But um, there'll be a pedestrian crossing across the rail trail with, you know, with the very hard stops for, for uh, recreational vehicles to stop and pause there if somebody is crossing. And then on the outside, there'll be a parking lot. There'll be a dedicated parking lot at the corner of, of Proton and Gray Street, strictly for the rail trail people, snowmobiles and trucks and trailers and recreational vehicle parking. And then there'll be a medical center parking lot, which will be much bigger. And included in that medical center parking lot will be accessible parking, of course, and a uh, Mennonite uh, building stall for parking horses. And mm -hmm. hopefully, some, either around the some of that will be some some community gardens, or they may be around the the uh, building. But that's yet to be decided. But it's uh, it's going to be uh, the whole building will be accessible. It'll be a three-story structure. And we're hoping to have, it's being worked on that there'll be an extension of Chapman House uh, with uh, possibly two or three beds on the top floor for uh, palliative care. So uh, we're pretty excited about this project and uh, you know, it's, there's been a lot of work done, but the property uh, has been surveyed, the agreements in place and the transfer of this Gray County land to Southgate's care for the parking lot area will be completed in the next 30 days. Wow, uh, that is exciting, wow. I, I think that's it regarding the clinic, unless there's any problem, or problems, any questions. No, 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 that sounds really exciting. I guess Erskine really doesn't meet all the needs that you need. Will that continue well, or? Erskine will be part of the solutions uh in transition and maybe when we start uh opening up but does it become a senior facility or is i think there'll be ample space uh because the lions are going to uh, transfer or they have transferred the old medical center to the care of southeast gray and southeast gray community health center don't want the property they want to see it used for something else and as much uh, we've talked this to Great County Housing, they can't make it work. We're talking to some others to see if they can make it work for some sort of a seniors housing. Um, but as um, uh, I listened to the Abbey Field, I thought, wow, what a fit that could be. And maybe the Erskine Center as well. I don't know, but I'm just throwing ideas out of what will stick and what will work. We'll see in time. but. Uh, uh, the medical, the old medical center will be converted to some sort of, we hope, affordable or attainable living or a seniors facility or something. Yeah. That yeah. Might be a great fit. I don't know. Uh, that sounds really, really is interesting. Wow. Uh, this place is growing, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. Anyone else have new business to bring? I have another one just after yes. everybody's had their chance. I'm good, so. Okay, I guess I'm on again. I just wanna uh, share with everyone that uh, vaccination clinics, we've had three of them in Dundalk now, they've been very successful. The first one was uh, five hours in length, uh, 294 people were vaccinated. Second one was uh, later in the day, so we went 10 to three the first time, and we asked that the next time they come that they try and cater to people coming home from work, so we did a three to seven. At 188, uh, and then we did a four to seven here just this week, and I think there was uh, somewhere between 65 and 75, and I stand corrected because I haven't got the official numbers. But uh, so um, that's th those have been very successful, um, and uh, 
other than that, I think that's really uh, the downtown accessible project. I was glad to hear somebody bring that up. Um, don't be afraid to speak up on that as a seniors group because that was something we really didn't get um, feedback from. And I think that was the fault of us not gathering and COVID and all this other stuff. But maybe the business owners need to hear from you that, uh, you know, if you think that accessibility of our downtown is important, we think it is. Uh, and there's evidence that, uh, you know, businesses do better when their buildings are accessible, but uh, uh, it needs the support of the business uh, community and we're working at that, but maybe a prod ahead by the seniors uh, committee would be helpful to have them realize that, uh, you know, downtown needs to be a place where people can shop and be comfortable and be accessible to uh, buildings. So. I think that's about it. Um, there'll be a lot more information about, about vaccination cards and so on in the coming weeks, but we'll see where that goes. Do you really think think that some people have had difficulty getting to the clinics and getting vaccinations? Has it been a challenge? Has that um, been a so, barrier? Yeah, so that's why they noticed uh, Dr. Ayer has been very informative to us about those kind of things and the Owen Sound Concordant and Hanover Clinic started falling off in July and that's why they implemented these uh, clinics in the small communities like Dundalk and you know around like we didn't go to Holstein we asked them about that and when the research was done is Mount Forest has really served well that Holstein right. community so you know they're having them in Durham and all over so and then really that focus was to uh, set aside the, I'm not going to say excuse, but the reason that transportation was restrictive. So transportation is not restrictive now. I mean, we've had a lot of buggies drive up and, and uh, cars. And so uh, I think right now it's, you know, it's just uh, we need to continue to push to let people know and realize that getting a vaccination is about keeping, making your community safe because uh, it's, uh, it's to get that herd immunity and Dr. Arrow is very clear that herd immunity now with this Delta variant has to get to 90% to, to be successful or we'll continue to see this fourth wave based on Delta's uh, increased ability to tra transfer from one person to another. And where is yeah. South State now, Dave, do you know? They don't give a stat specifically on our vaccination level. It's more on a no. county level. And he I believe they're somewhere either approaching or in that 70% range. He was, I mean, about a month ago, I think it was 61. Oh, but wow. uh, yeah. I'll go knocking on doors if you need somebody. Well, <laughs> yeah, some of this is a real some of this is a real challenge because it's a personal choice. It's uh it's no, maybe it's it's maybe a cult uh, thing that you know peer pressure, but it's it's basically younger people um, that are, you know, avoiding the vaccination because I think they feel they're bulletproof. And I'm not sure that the Delta variant is uh, one that selects whether you're bulletproof or not. Well, and now they're starting to report out the, the COVID cases with a double vaccination, a single vaccination, and no vaccination. And that yes. might smarten some of them up. Yeah. To come yeah. And they split it up. I'm yeah. not sure we need all that information, but no. it might just make some people move. For sure. He has consistently said that 95% of the hospitalizations in the province, and it might be Canada, but I believe it was he was quoting the province, are 95% are non vaccinated people. Mm. That's high. Mm. Wow. Well, that, that there's a case for getting vaccinated, that's for sure. Okay. All right. Well, if we're done with new business, uh, members privilege. Do you want to start, Muriel? Good news and celebrations. <laughs> oh, okay. There she is. No. Nope. I have mixed feelings because it's been so nice to have summer and and uh, be able to see a few more people and get together with a few people and then the fourth wave looms <laughs> so it's I don't know 
So yeah, I have to be careful right? at, at this point for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, Catherine, would you like to jump in? Well, speaking of COVID, I finally got my second uh, vaccine, so I'm fully vaccinated. That's my greatest news. Yes. Mm. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Arlene? I'll give you Holstein. We're using the walking path a lot. So the VON, because we couldn't get into buildings, they did do a lot of classes on Zoom, but there's still that whole social thing going on. So we have um, two walking classes and we sort of combine them. So slower class walks one way, faster class walks the other way, and it's working out very well. It's not a huge number coming out, but they're coming out steadily. So it's really good for us. And wow. they're talking about going back in the buildings, but I too am afraid of the fourth wave. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to wait wait and see. That's encouraging. Yeah, it. it, it I know this COVID isn't done, but uh, it, it there are encouraging signs, and it is exciting to see the emphasis COVID has brought to light the problems and issues in long-term care. and uh, But I think we still need to apply pressure to make sure that the government uh, do not uh, sit back and uh, put it aside. So I think any our, our activities can be helpful in that. And uh, other than that, I'm vaccinated too, and I'm happy to be so. And we have our fish fry tonight. I'm going over there as soon as we finish. and. Uh, We've got uh, oh, 165 meals sold, so it should be a really good afternoon so or evening. And uh, anyone else online that uh, Dave's, Dave's gone, I think. So anyone else want to add anything? Okay, so we'll call the meeting to, to uh, rather we'll, we'll close the meeting. It's almost 10 to four. That's really wow, the long one today. Um, and uh, that's it. I'm wondering, uh, Lindsay, if I could uh, see the minutes before they get published. Yeah, sure. Okay. We yeah, just, just proof it a little bit, okay? Because last time some stuff slipped in that I thought maybe didn't need to be published. So uh, okay. I just kind of like to give it a review. Yeah. Can we, okay. just, grab a, can we just grab a mover for, for the adjournment, please? That's all we oh, okay. oh, we got two. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you very much for your participation, ladies, and uh, we'll uh, be talking to you then. All right. Bye-bye. Good meeting. Thanks, Ellie. Bye.